So, all right, everyone, let's start to talk about chapter five, how we represent code. So in the last chapter, we defined our scanner, which took uh, the raw, raw source code uh, string and transform it into a series of tokens. And the parser we will write next chapter, we'll take those tokens and transform them into something. And in this chapter, we will define what this something is. So the book did not talk about intuition. How, how do we mentally evaluate an arithmetic expression like this? We probably intuitively know that we need to evaluate the multiply first. So that's, that, that's kind of the precedence, the precedence of the operator is implicit and we can visualize the precedence explicitly using a tree like like this now now now, now it's kind of very explicit uh, that we always need to to evaluate the in this expression, we always need to uh, evaluate the multiply first because if we don't, haven't evaluated the multiply, we don't know about this part and we can't evaluate this plus. And similarly, we, we can't evaluate this uh, minus if we haven't evaluated this plus. So with this kind of Three representation, the evaluation order is, is explicit. We don't have any precedence problem. So, and then the book started to talk about uh, context free grammar. The book doesn't give a formal definition of context-free grammar, and it's fine. We we are just using like some informal uh, intuition of it. And uh, in the previous chapter for the scanner, we usually just deal with regular language. We we have we have a bunch of characters, we make them into tokens, but regular languages is not powerful enough to handle uh, the expressions that we need to parse. In particular, regular languages, they can't deal with uh, those kind of induction, uh, inductively defined structures where we have we have some, some kind of uh, recursion going on and the regular languages can't deal with it. So that's where the context-free grammar comes in. So the, it is the next heaviest tool in the toolbox of formal grammars. So there are regular language, which is the simplest, and then it's context-free grammar, which is normally what we will use in programming languages. And then there are also uh, context-sensitive grammar, and also we will not talk about that here. So, we already have a bunch of a bunch of tokens, and then and then we can. So the last chapter we are dealing with the lexical grammar, where we have each individual 
characters, then we kind of mix them into a bunch of tokens. But in here, we already have a bunch of tokens. So we can treat our tokens as uh, alphabet rather than just individual characters. And then for, for a string, instead of saying a token is the string as a sequence of tokens, we can say the entire expression is a string. So we can see, you see kind of there is a parallel here between the two grammars we need to deal with. The one is we need to deal with in the previous chapter and the second one is what we are defining today and we need to parse in the next chapter. And since our grammar is a little bit more complicated, we kind of need some rule to define it. But how do we define such grammar? Where we have infinite number of strings, we obviously can't just list them all out. So instead we will need to have some rules to specify what kind of set of uh, string consists wallet. Uh, what is streams in the grammar and and the stream so we use rules to generate streams this way and stream created this way are called derivations since they derived the, from the rule of the grammar And the, the rules themselves are called productions. Those are, those are just some terminologies. And also each production has a head and, uh, and a body. Later when we talk about BNF, we can show what each part of those actually are. But just we have a bunch of terminologies, head and body. And also the body is the list of symbols and the symbols come in two, two flavor. One is terminal, which is just letter from the alphabet. Just in our case, it is terminal is a token and non-terminal is a reference to another rules, which means we can, we can just think about it as a recursion, we can just plug another rule here. And our head, our head all, always have only a single symbol because that's a, that's a characteristic of context-free grammars for more powerful formalism like unrestricted grammar, we can have multiple symbols in the head. So we need some way to write down those rules. People are trying to formalize grammar since forever, but uh, it's until like John Backus and the company needed a notation for specifying algo. 58 that they come up with this BNF notation. Even though BNF is not a like uniform notation, like everyone use some kind of, some of their own flavor, but it is kind of still understandable for different people, just everyone have their own quarks and use them a little bit differently. So for this book, he, the author used this kind of notation for each, each rule. It's a name and the head is here, follows, uh, follows an arrow and then 
and the symbols are at the right hand side and the same column. And the ported stream means the terminal, the non terminals are lowercase word that refers to other rules like protein refers to this protein. And with, with this grammar, we can start to generate random breakfast, like sausage with uh, something, something on the side. And we can see like sausage with fried, uh, fried egg on the side, for example, this is one way to specify, and we we have actually an infinite choice of how to generate those kind of breakfast because we have recursion here and here. It's like we can infinitely plug in more more kind of stuff into it. Any questions? Someone want to talk? Um, his definition of the, the, I forget if he's already said this or he's gonna say it, but how he talks about when you have the recursion on like both sides of the, um, I forget what it's called, of the terminal, like indicates uh, that it's normally a context-free grammar. Um, I thought that was interesting because when you think about it, if it's only on one side, then you can like, uh, then that means that you could probably, what's it called? Like a tail loop recursion optimization, those kinds of things. But when you have the recursion on both sides, it, you know, you normally can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I, I took like theory of computation a while ago, so I, I don't even remember the definition of context-free grammar, but I think your intuition is right. Well, he talks about that here, how like, how, why you can't write regexes for one, because if it were just on one side, you could write a regex to like count the repetitions. But yeah. then to be able to apply that same number of repetitions on the other side, uh, I guess you can't do it with regex. Yeah. And our, uh, our grammar is a little bit verbose because all those repetitions to for different rules. So then instead he decided to just add some regex notation into the grammar. So we have all we have pipe notation for all. We have we have the parentheses for grouping. We have the um, postfix star for zero or more, and plus for one or more. And the question mark for zero or one. With all of those, with all of those, we our notation can be our grammar can be greatly simplified into just this. So I think I think this is people usually do. Uh, 
And yeah, I think EBNF is a kind of more standardized notation for how to write this extended uh, back as neural form. So, and in, in here, he started to define the grammar for our language. In, in the previous chapter, he kind of just defined the, everything for the lexical grammar, but here he just defined the subset of the language that he need to use in next couple of chapters, and then he add more construct in the fly. So in here, we just have expressions which have unary, binary, grouping, and literal. Literals are like number, string, Boolean literal, and now grouping is just for parentheses. Uh, we have unary and binary expression and for binary is like two expressions with an operator in the middle. And the operator can be of those. Something that I thought would be cool is like, because later on when we write that tool to generate the Java code based on our, um, based on our, based on our grammar, it would be cool if we actually made it based on like this syntax here. That's what that's where I was thinking we were going, but then we ended up not doing that. But then he actually, um, I was thinking about it, why we didn't do it that, and then I realized that like by re rereading some of the the side notes that like oh that would just be another like that would just be another parser, you know? Yeah, yeah, you need to parse your BNF. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Because at first I was like, we could just parse this and and then instead of using, because I think this syntax is cooler than the other syntax, but then it's like, oh, then you just get into this recursive problem. Yeah. You are basically trying to invent a, like a parser generator kind of stuff. If yeah. You're, you're going to wrap the whole too deep. Mm -hmm. Also, there are some something like numbers and string is not specified in this grammar. So you just keep it capitalized. Otherwise, number and string can also expand into. Yeah. And this, this grammar as it is, is ambiguous. We can't actually parse that just using this grammar because of like these operators. But we will deal with that next chapter. It's good enough as a, like internal representation. It's just, we, we don't have enough information to parse it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, the side panel asks to like come up with some examples of how it could be ambiguous yeah i actually didn't do that but maybe someone else did it's pretty easy to come up with something yeah. just because you you have you have binary expressions with like you can just have chains of operators and then there are no precedents in these grammars and we immediately have ambiguity of how to parse that. Mm -hmm.
So as we said before, our data structure is a tree and in, in a lot of compilers, in a lot of compilers, there will be just a single expression class with like generic expression class or struct and it have everything in it, but instead, the, since this is Java, uh, they also decide to use inheritance, which is actually a pretty nice way to solve this problem. So there is a abstract class expression, and then we just have a bunch of different expressions extend the abstract class. But also since it is Java, it is very verbose. I, I'm not familiar with modern Java enough to, does Java have a record type, type now that make, makes this thing more manageable? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't use Java. Uh, but looking at this, it made it, it seem really, really weird. Um, I used Kotlin and you can do something like similar to this in Kotlin because it's, you know, like just Java, but better. But I ended up using a, a data classes instead since that that's like, that's more like a record type. Yeah. I don't know if this is like idiomatic Java, but if it is, then that's gross. This used to be idiomatic Java. Yeah. No, I'm not sure because I'm not familiar with modern Java. <laughs> but it's, yeah. It's just funny just... how like, it sucks so bad that like we end up spending like half the chapter just writing a code gen tool. <laughs> yeah, I write a code gen for this because this is so yeah. bad. Yeah, because like that's a, actually like the code gen tool that we write, it is pretty much just like a record. Like, like you could just rename that from like generate ASC to generate records. Well, then we added some like ASC specific things later, but at first it literally is just like, you give it types and you give it names of fields and then you just create a class and all that stuff. So at yeah. first you do just make a record generator thing. So then it started to talk about a little bit. This object is not really ob so-called object oriented because it doesn't have any method associated with them. And then it started to talk about why not? Because our tree class is kind of intermediate representation that cross multiple domains of our interpreter. If first we parse them, parse them into the tree, and and then then we also can do a bunch of things with the tree. We can print. So we need to pretty print it. So we need to interpret it. We need to resolve the name for it. If it's static type language, we need to type checking on it. So it become a little weird to add method to the expression. So we, if we add methods to each individual classes, we will have a bunch of different methods of different domains all crammed into here. So. So he, so he will further note that object oriented solution like bundle method with the object is just not a good solution here. And in, instead, instead we will use a different approach later, which is a visitor pattern. I think it's interesting because when we did the lexer, we didn't do that. Like, I actually commented this the last time we met, but um, 
for the Lexer, we just have like we do just have like one uh we just have one class that's like has all the fields that um that a token could possibly have and i remember mentioning that like if you wanted to do it more functionally you could use some kind of like record or something for the different ones and have a discriminated union for like your general token type and that's more what we're doing in this chapter yeah but he he actually he has a slide note on that later this just like uh, for for tokens is not that much. Like we have we have so, certain tokens that can contain that value, but that's it. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I also think it's a good as an author because like because he's just showing different ways to do it as well. You know. Yeah. So it gives you more tools, but I also think that it makes sense because it's so because. Like since tokens can only have like four different things associated with them anyways, it's not such a big deal to just like set them all to null for most of them and only use this one for this type of token. And, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah. But you couldn't do that for like expressions. Because you'd, you'd have a million different things. I'm saying a lot of compilers actually did that. It's just have a generic... Uh, AST node type. Really? And yeah, it's actually, actually it have merits of that. Consider languages like C that don't have inheritance. If you have like a union to represent, then it's really hard to add common common functions to it. Okay. Like what? Like, for example, tree traversal. Oh, right. I see. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you could just do it kind of the C way, where you just have like a virtual functions or something, or it's C, so you make your own, you know. Yeah, it's, you need to. So with a giant, like, an ASC node class, you can just do it once. Otherwise, you need to do a giant switch statement. And you, whenever you add new type, you need to change it, basically. Yeah. So it does have merit. Yeah. Okay, then it's start to talk about this this class is so like verbose, so they decide to use some code gen to do that. I really don't know how to think about that. <laughs> but basically idea is we just We just have a bunch of strings and and then read this string and output some output Java code a uh, string. Yeah, so I like I ended up following along with this as an exercise, but in reality and not Java, or maybe in newer Java, you can kind of just like skip this part because you can. Uh, it's it's pretty concise syntax just to like write it to write the different um, uh, expression types. Yeah, yeah. This have serious maintenance cost. Things I will like. Yeah. We have separate build step basically. So I'd rather not do this, but <laughs> I guess I guess in some some cases it's not avoidable. Java's, yeah, maybe Java's just that bad that you gotta bite the bullet. Yeah, yeah. We'll probably yeah, do the same I... C later on as well. I mean, there it also makes sense for C because that's also hard to write. Yeah, C C also is a case where yeah C C don't have like even just even just template C C don't have. A, I mean, C is like mostly. I mean, if you look at a lot of C code bases, like it's mostly yeah. 
preprocessor macros everywhere. Yeah. But I guess that's the thing. At least C kind of has that built in, while Java doesn't, which does make it a little janker in Java. Yeah, but also preprocessor is really hard to write for large stuff. Yeah, yeah. You, you give some, you, you lose some. Yeah, and then he started to talk about the, the visitor pattern. First, firstly, we all know this is anti-pattern. If we do a chain of like, if an object is an instance of something, because this is really, really slow. That's that's why all was all OOP languages. Uh, make these keywords long or just make this as inconvenient as possible. Is that actually why they do that? That's funny. They should just make oh, it a random, if they didn't, if they wanted to make it hard to use, they just should have made it a random sequence of characters that you have to remember, you know, like 14 different random letters. Oh, just some like UUID you have to like paste into your code in order to get it. But that's too hard to use, I guess. Still, sometimes it's convenient. Yeah. I feel like you want to punish the person that's trying to do it, not the poor person that has to maintain their code. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Shouldn't punish the readability. So in, instead of instead of doing this, we need to do like another approach to dispatch the expression, which turns to involve this, but also we already said methods like add adding method kind of being ad hoc fashion is not a good solution here. And before it introduced a visit pattern, the book first talk about the expression problem, which is just like, we have a bunch of types and a bunch of operation we need to do with the types. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was my favorite part of the chapter. I thought this yeah. was really how he compared like how class-based languages and then like functional languages, how they, the different trade-offs between those. I thought that was really accurate. Yeah, it's just basically, yeah, in a class with a like method approach, we, it's hard to add add new class. Oh, sorry, it's hard to add new methods because to add, add new methods, method, we need yeah. to work for every class. But like in a functional language where you're mostly relying on like pattern matching, if you're doing a pattern matching approach, it's easy to add new like methods or add new behaviors because you can just add another case there. But then it's harder. But then it's harder to add new types because now you have to change a bunch of stuff everywhere, right? And all of your pattern matches. Yeah. Yeah. And basically there are no there are no like perfect solution to make both easy at the same time. Yeah. Some languages give you the tools to do both kinds of like scholars can give you the tools to do it both ways, but then it becomes difficult when you're like trying to architect your code to figure out like to figure out which style you want to use right because there's these different trade-offs here there's other trade-offs too but this is a big trade-off that he's mentioning now and then it can yeah. also make like code bases you know less consistent because like oh why do we use this pattern here and this pattern there and they say oh well, when we came up with this thing we thought that we would be adding more behaviors than we were adding new types. So we went with the, the functional approach, but then it turned out to not be the case. And we actually wish we had gone with classes and methods and oops. So 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, so actually for the interpreter case, I'm not that convinced that visitor is the best solution because we, are, we have those method. Then at least yeah, for this interpreter is a little bit different because we add those methods like in different chapters. But yeah, yeah like if you're a prototype a language, I think a lot of more time is like you, <laughs> write an interpreter like full of working interpreter first and add more and more language features, which means more and more ASC nodes. Yeah, but I think that's the challenge is like when you're trying to figure out which one to use is like you have to estimate which, which kinds of changes you're going to be making yeah. and then design it that way. Which I actually just think it was interesting. I hadn't thought of it like that before. You know, because normally when you're writing code, you're thinking more of like, um, like, like you think less about the types of, well, no, I guess you, you think about that as well. I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, so it comments that yeah we can we can either easily to add new types or add new operations. We can have languages that support both, but still there are no way to do both easily at the same time. And then, and then we start to talk about the visitor patterns. So visitor patterns is a way to kind of invert the equation of the object-oriented language where it is easy to add types from easy to add types to easy, easier to add operations. Since since object oriented language tend to support something like pattern matching natively, and then it start to talk about visitor pattern is a little bit uh, hard to understand because the pattern is not really about visiting a tree. Then the name like visit and accept doesn't mean anything. So yeah, a lot of cases, like in our case, we are dealing with a tree, but that is not really the case for the visitor pattern. It can use for even a shallow inheritance, not really a tree. We can still use the visitor pattern. And uh, it's, we'll talk about a little a simpler case where rather than using the auto-generated uh, expression class, since like combining this with code gen is difficult. So we just have a Patry class where we have like two children. And we want to define new operations without adding new method to them. So instead we just define an interface, visitor interface. And then there's a comment that, 
So those methods in the original design pattern book or in just normally how visitor is presented is both of those methods are called visit. So he thinks this is a little bit confusing since it leads the reader to think that the correct visit method is choosing at runtime based on the parameter type, which is not the case. The correct visit method, is, it's just like uh, overloading, which is dispatched at compile time. But though, though I, I do have some comments about this book, never talk about, but never talk about that later. Uh, and then in the Patrick class itself, we need to have an accept, accept of the visitor interface. And in the accept itself, we just need to call the corresponding visit. Notice all of those are all of those are like concrete. So those those themselves are not they're not choosing at runtime. We just choose always choose this method at compile time. If we call them with it, it's still like since we pass this in, we will use overloading. We we'll always choose yeah. those at compile time. Yeah. So to perform an operation, we just call the accept method and pass the visitor in. And then this, this, this image, So yeah, I think that's this part. But before continuing, I do want to mention something this book never talk about. And I think it's important, even, even though it's not related to the book, is that the visitor is actually double dispatching where in the pattern matching is not necessarily the case. So we talk about, this visit, this visit method is uh, resolved at compile time, which is true, but the visitor itself is resolved at runtime. So we yeah, actually have that. that. What? Sorry. That's a good point. I didn't think of that. Like the way yeah. I ended up implementing this was actually, I think, only resolves at once. Yeah, but it's just like we. We often not use this fact. We often use this as a single dispatch, but we pay the cost of double dispatch. Like if in like if in, is you use it in C++, you will find like if you implement visit pattern in the C++, you find like not only accept is a virtual function, this visit is also a virtual function. Yeah. So you need to call virtual function twice, basically. If yeah, if you are using pattern matching approach uh, to mimic the visitor pattern, it's actually you are pattern matching on not only the object itself but the visitor. Just we often not use the fact that the visitor can be runtime. We can just throw in a visitor in. We use a fixed visitor usually but it is there. Okay, yeah, that's my comment. And, and then this is just for the expression, for expression, we add a bunch of like stream processing stuff to define the visitors.
Yeah. Like if you thought the last part was bad, I mean, this is, this isn't great either. I mean, could you do this with records in Java? I don't know. I haven't used them. I, I have no idea. I, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Just can record have method basically is this a question? I don't know. Yeah. And yeah, notice here, except actually returns the uh, returns a type, returns a generic type here. Each since since we need to accept to like sometimes I want we want it to spit out some like other expression, for example. So we want to return generic type. And I will further comment that you can't do that in C++. So if you are implementing that in C++, you need some other tricks, just like you need to this always be void and then use some odd parameters, for example. Unfortunately. And for the last, we will use our visitor class to define a pretty printer. We like something like this is not very really helpful because it is still ambiguous. Even though in this case is for our human, it's really easy to see. But uh, we know a lot of time with Bunch of expressions without parentheses, it's become very hard to human to see like what's the order of what is the precedence. So instead, we will pretty print the S expression format. Which will make the nesting and the grouping very explicit. And to do to do that, we just need to define a new new visitor, which this visitor also returns a string. And and then. In in the visitor in the visitor itself, we just need to call the accept function. And then we need to <laughs> we need to imp implement all those visit methods. for each of, uh, of our different types of expressions. And most of them are just a boilerplate, but we do have this parenthes parenthesis function that basically just prints the printer expression. You like recursively call our visitor to print the expression, but we append the parentheses into it. And with that, we can even test it. We just manually create an expression. Since we haven't implemented our parser yet, we just manually create the expression and then use the pretty printer to print it. And we can get a good result.
also there is a comment about like we always all not always but we often use the visitor pattern in a recursive manner like this that's why people think it have something to do with trees but it's not always the case yeah i was actually i think i was a victim of this uh misperception because i also thought that i think it's cool that like i'd actually i hadn't thought of it as a visitor pattern before but i've actually implemented similar things like this before like the this kind of redirection and i hadn't thought of it as being a um i hadn't thought of it as being a visitor pattern before it was just like something i i came up with but then looking at it again it's like the exact same as the code that i've also written before dealing with visitor patterns so yeah <laughs> that, I guess that's why it's called design patterns. It's like <laughs> those kind of things are needed. And even if it's not written in that you know, full book, people will reinvent those kind of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I always thought it had to do with like recursion and definitely having to do with like iteration as well. Yeah. Like I always thought that like, like, visitor pattern is very similar to like the iterator pattern but like sort of moving things around but i see now that it's more different than that yeah okay i think we are done with these chapters stop recording and <laughs>